Jackson. She's a little bit younger than her. She's, um, she's four and a half. So, you know, her birthday's in March, so it's, I guess she's April, May, June, July, yeah. so four and a half. We're going to be in Berlin next year. Um, this monitor has a fellowship. Oh, yeah? That's great. Yeah, it's all academic, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it'll, and she'll just be starting kindergarten, so it'll be interesting. And, you know, I mean, it's, you know, you have a connection with Spanish, so locally we had, has been exposed. I mean, German. I mean, I don't know. It seems like the only English or bilingual school is pretty far away. Other, other, other academics who brought kids at Eleanor's age seem to have put their kids in. I mean, I don't know if you freak out if she does something. I mean, I, I don't know how it would be. I don't know. Not because anything particular at Eleanor, but I mean, you just put a kid in another, I mean, journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so that was pretty tough. I mean, yeah. I mean, to be flexible. <laughs> Um, I think we're going to get started. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Andrea Lim. I'm an editor here at Verso, and I'm very proud to have worked on this book with George. Um, so this book, uh, Building the Commune, is uh, we're co-publishing it with Jacobin. Um, and it's part of the Jacobin series. We've done uh, a whole bunch of books already. And this one and Peter Fraze's Four Futures are both launching uh, this month, which we're very excited about. Um, and uh, we also have another launch event for Four Futures next Thursday, also here, same time, I think. Um, so you should also come back for that. Uh, but for tonight, we are here to celebrate uh, building the commune. And so I see some of you already have copies of it, but for anybody who hasn't had the chance to check it out yet, um, it's a book about um, radical democracy in Venezuela, or I guess more specifically, it's about uh, this, the grassroots movement of communes that have been popping up in Venezuela for decades now. And uh, more recently have been inspiring like movements uh, all across the globe like Occupy or uh, the Arab Spring who you know they all have different aims and come out of different social contexts but all of them have ideals or ideals of radical democracy at their core so um, George and Greg here will talk a lot more about that, but um, I encourage you after this to stick around and we, I think we'll be serving drinks uh, during the event. Um, all of, uh, so yeah, if you wanna get drunk, like, feel free, we're here. Um, I think all of our books are 40% uh, off and the Jacobin books are also $10. Um, and so, our speakers tonight, we have our author, George Cicero Lamar, who is Associate Professor of Politics and Global Studies at Drexel University in Philadelphia, also the author of We Created Chavez, and very soon, um, Decolonizing Dialectics. And we also have Greg Grandin, who is a professor of history at NYU and author of many, many excellent books, uh, including most recently uh, Kissinger's Shadow, uh, Fordlandia, and I'm sure anybody who pays attention to Latin American history has come across his work before. So uh, without further ado, I'm just gonna hand the stage over to you guys. Thanks. Thank you, I, uh, and thanks for inviting me to participate in this. Let me just say that this is a building the commune. It's a really, George's book is a really great achievement. It's really, um, you know, like everything that George does, it's it's uh, it's analytically acute. It's um, it's it's uh, passionately written. It's um, it's really it's really. I, I, as I was reading it, I was thinking it's not just a kind of answer to to questions that arise out of the current crisis in Venezuela, but it, it's really an intent to to reframe the question to you know to not be pulled into a debate 
um, that it, that oftentimes the way that mainstream coverage of Venezuela, which you know, which you know, actually we have Gabriel, Gabriel in the audience, and he's done a really terrific job in the nation, kind of countering or trying to um, uh, you know um, have a more kind of um, sober view of what's going on. But George's George's work is really really um, about busting through and breaking down the frame in which we're often forced to think about Venezuela and asking new questions. It's really a terrific book, and so I would urge everybody to purchase a copy, and, and congratulations on, on writing it. And it's really great to be here for the very first event, uh, celebration of the book. I guess I, I would just start with the way George does in, in the book with a, a 2012 um, speech, or not speech, but um, a, an event that I guess Hugo Chavez uh, was, you know, right before he died, or uh, in which, I mean, it's a very poignant um, uh, uh, episode in which um, he asks a very simple question, but I think you know, obviously embedded in that question, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole world. And the question is, and I guess it's the same question I'll just ask, ask George, uh, where is the commune? <laughs> you know, when this is Hugo Chavez right before he died, was, it was almost the pleading kind of question to his ministers. And you know, where is the commune? And I guess maybe that's a, that'll just be a kind of opening for you to explain what you mean by a commune, both actually, both, both in practically terms, but also in terms of, of aspirational. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate especially your comment about not being drawn into debates. Um, at the same time, I'm, I'm sure that this will happen afterward in the question and answer. I welcome it. Um, I think there are a lot of things that we won't be able to really talk about. And part of what the book does is kind of skirt a lot of these very important debates, um, but they're debates that can be had as well. Um, thank you for being here, Greg. I really appreciate it. Thank you to, to Verso for making this possible, to Audrey in particular for the tireless editing that went into the, the, the book, um, to Basker for encouraging, actively recruiting me um, to be part of a really great series um, of books uh, that, that Verso and Jacobin are doing together. So I'm very glad on many levels to, to be in the series and to be here. Um, and thank you to you all for, uh, for showing up. This is awesome. Um, where is the commune? What is the commune is maybe a better place to start. Um, People, I think, like to talk about Venezuela, this is clear, um, and yet there's very little interest in understanding, I think, what's going on and what has been going on in Venezuela. I almost feel, I was thinking about it today, I feel like when, when Venezuela's in the news, I feel like less understanding is being administered to the public uh, than maybe in times when Venezuela is not in the news and actual conversations can be had and discussions can be kind of hashed out. So we're in one of those moments, right, in which everyone's talking about Venezuela. No one's really saying anything that makes any kind of sense about it. We hear talk about caudillismo and authoritarianism and dictatorship even and uh, trampling of human rights. And so I'm glad to, uh, uh, you know, dismantle any of those things in the question and answer if you'd like. Um, but what I want to talk about actually is the piece that we never really hear about. In other words, the participatory grassroots histories that uh, did not come about because of Hugo Chavez, but came about long before him, that came about long before this revolution, and that are the backbone and continue to be the backbone of a powerful movement, um, despite what we're sort of seeing as a current crisis macroeconomic and political, um, and that's part of what the book does. It sort of situates a long history of where this revolutionary process came from. And I've you know, said and insisted before, and I'll do it again, that when we begin to look at this history, we don't begin with 1998, which is the year that Chavez was elected. We don't begin even in 1992, which was the year that Chavez sort of burst into uh, Venezuelan political consciousness in a failed coup d'etat, after which he went on TV um, very famously and became a national hero overnight. This is 92. If we're looking for a starting point, or better understood, a, a moment of rupture, and this is where I begin the book, it actually occurs in 1989, and it marks out a great deal about what uh, I want to say about Venezuela in the global context. Um, why? Because 1989 was a moment of mass rebellion. Uh, it was the, the date of a week-long riot um, marked by rebelling, rioting, looting, taking over the city um, that really made it perfectly clear in 
in Venezuela that things could not continue as they were, um, and served as a sort of a, a, a turning point in a watershed in Venezuelan uh, history, opening up the possibility for a Chavez or for some other articulation of popular movements to develop um, and to push uh, things forward. And part of why that's globally important is because uh, I, I, you know, I argue in the book that when we're talking about what's been going on very publicly, especially since the emergence of the Arab Spring and Occupy, um, and more recently, we're talking about movements that are both kind of against and for, um, heavily, often against liberal, uh, neoliberalism, emerging in a context in which neoliberalism, in other, in other words, the sort of unhindered and untrammeled control of the market is being imposed not through the market, but through the sort of most ferocious state interventions in Chile with the, the coup by Pinochet in other Latin American countries in which we see Latin America as a kind of test tube for this neoliberal experiment. And it's against this that 1989 in, in Venezuela emerges as a mass popular rebellion. Um, and it's against this that alternatives begin to develop. Now, what is the commune? Back to the question. Um, concretely speaking, if we're talking about what the communes actually are in Venezuela, we need to begin by talking about what their building blocks are. In 2006, um, formally speaking, uh, they're developed in Venezuela what were called communal councils in which neighbors get together, uh, form uh, a popular assembly and debate and discuss and make binding decisions about uh, how to manage their own local neighborhood. This is 2006. In 2010, then, on paper, we have the emergence of communes. In other words, what is it that happens when you bring these small units of popular self-government together in larger, broader units? But something else important happens in the process. One of the, the uh, sort of shortcomings and disadvantages of local grassroots democracy in these communal councils that developed in Venezuela is that they were purely political, or mostly political, we could say. In other words, you make political decisions about how to govern your local neighborhood, and yet the question of funding um, is very much uh, one that relies on government, relies on other sources, and yet what happens in the communes uh, more recently, these larger agglomerations of part, po popular participation in Venezuela is that they bring together not only local organs of political participation and self-control, self-government, but also of economic production. So a commune brings together communal councils, these democratic popular assemblies, with what are called uh, social property enterprises, in other words, socialist businesses. These socialist businesses can be either direct or indirect. Uh, indirect means that they're co-owned with the state, but direct, and I think it's really worth underlining uh, what this looks like in practice, a direct socially, uh, a social property enterprise in Venezuela is one that is directly managed by the parliament of the commune. In other words, the delegates get together, discuss, debate, and make all of the decisions about what is produced in these businesses, how it's produced, how much the workers are paid, how long they work, how the product is distributed, and what to do with the surplus. That surplus is reinvested into the communes. This is what the communes are in concrete practice, and it's, uh, it's very important to emphasize that while this is not a universal institution in Venezuela. The entire country is not governed in this way, and there are a great deal of communes that don't function as well as they should. We're still talking about a really incredibly inspiring example and experiment in popular democracy. What these communes seek to do by building a new economy is, I would argue as well, to build and develop a new state because you're talking about radically decentralized control of the production process, producing what communities need locally, distributing them locally, um, and in a way, seizing away territory from both the private sector and from the state. And I'll talk more about the state in a minute. I'll talk more about the state right now. I'll let that be <laughs> Because what I want to say is that despite, in, in a way, what I've just said and the dates that have been laid out, 2006, communal councils are established, 2010, uh, the com communes are, are established, it's really important to understand that the communes are not created by the Venezuelan state. This may sound like a contradiction, 
Um, but again, when we look back and when we shift our lens and look at this grassroots history, things come into focus in a slightly different way. We see that before 2006, when these communal councils are established, and after the Caracaso in 1989, you have the flourishing of local barrio assemblies, in other words, spontaneous, explosive, participatory institutions that develop from the ground up, that serve as prototypes for what would become these communal councils down the road. And if there's anything you can say about Venezuelan revolutionary movements, it's that they do not wait for the state to tell them that they're allowed to do something before they do it. And so long before the communes existed on paper, people were building them. They were bringing together these communal councils, they were building socialist enterprises, and they were attempting to figure out what it would look like to govern territory in a directly democratic and socialist way. And so if anything, this experience looked at in the right way confirms things that, you know, you know, what Marx says, in other words, revolution is not made by laws. It's made by the people directly uh, making that revolution themselves, to which I like to add C.L.R. James, the great uh, Trinidadian revolutionary who said, uh, you know, revolutions do not occur in parliaments, they're registered there. And so if we focus on the institutional apparatus, we lose the force uh, in a way uh, behind it. Now, to say that the communes are not created by the state is also to point toward one of the direct contradictions and deep tensions of these communes, one of the dangers that threaten these communes, because what we actually see is that, and I would argue the tendency is for the strongest and the most well-organized of Venezuela's communes to be in direct antagonism and contradiction with the central state. This gets glossed over and missed an awful lot. I mean, it's a, it goes right with hand in hand with the simplification of what Chavismo is. You know, the followers are blind, followers of an individual. Nothing is happening at the grassroots level, and yet the whole history is marked by tense participatory uh, debates and, 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 and even struggles within. We have great uh, historians and theorists and anthropologists in the audience who have written on the role of these participatory struggles in carving out an autonomy within and against uh, uh, the sort of leadership of, of the Chavista movement. And one of the examples I think that stands out in my mind of what it means for a commune to be anti-state uh, or to exist in a tense relationship with uh, the Venezuelan state is a commune called El Maisal. And this is a huge, sprawling corn commune um, in central west Venezuela. Uh, of, it produces 2,000 acres of corn in a directly communal and participatory way. Um, and yet, when you look at the history of this commune and when you listen to what the leaders of this commune have to say, it's a commune very much celebrated by the, by the Chavista uh, you know, uh, leadership, you realize that the tensions are, have, have been constant and are sort of really you know, the lived reality of the commune. This is a commune in which organizers had to struggle against local Chavista leaders in an attempt to expropriate the land. And then Chavez flew in one day on a helicopter and announced that it was expropriated and then got back onto the helicopter and left. And the people realized that it actually had simply been handed over to the State Agricultural Corporation. And so they had to struggle again against the State Agricultural Corporation in an attempt to make it really communal land. And they did so successfully with the support of people like Chavez, but against the Chavista, in, in many ways the Chavista bureaucracy, elements of the state um, and local party leadership. And when you ask, uh, the, the, you know, the leaders of this commune today, they say our biggest enemies, our major primary enemies in concrete everyday struggles are wearing Chavista red. In other words, they are attached to the government for whatever reason, whether they are Chavistas or they're cynical opportunists who have taken into Chavismo because it is the sort of governing uh, party. The reality is that they the lived experience of these communes is in, as, as a, an anti-government force and as an anti-state force. And in many ways, this reflects, of course, the history of what the commune is. You know, Marx, again, of, of, of the Paris Commune referred to it as a revolution against the state itself um, because it entailed self-government, as he puts it, self-government of the producers. And so I think we see this anti-state element in a different commune in Cuba, in, the, in, in what's called Terrazas de Cuba, uh, I observed and, and spoke to the organizers of a commune that was not formally recognized as a commune 
uh, at the time because local Chavista leaders had prevented and blocked these, you know, this very well-developed experiment in direct democracy and participation from becoming formally registered because to do so would be to cut into the authority of those leaders. And so you have this direct clash in many ways in practice between the state um, and these lo local sort of experiments in uh, direct democracy and directly democratic production. Now, should I keep talking? <laughs> now, if the conflicts with the states are, I think, one major element of what um, I need to, I want to get across in this book, um, the other main tension, and this is a tension I think that is really acute in the present, but also a moment of opportunity, as I'll say at the end, has to do with the question of production. Because what's interesting about Chavismo, what's interesting about the history of the Bolivarian Revolution is that it uh, finds its political spearhead in the barrios. In other words, in these urban conglomerations of, sort of shanty towns, slums, that developed in the course of the 20th century in Venezuela as a result of the exploitation of oil and the pressures and the tensions and the, and the lure that came along with that, in which people left the countryside and moved to the cities. Now, what this means in part is that these are actually not productive areas for the most part. And so if you speak to people who are attempting to develop communes in Venezuela, the primary contradiction and tension that they identify is they say, well, the question of how do we produce in unproductive terrain is really a pressing, pressing question. It's especially pressing because of the deep dependency that Venezuela has on imported goods, again, a legacy of the oil economy. And so you've probably heard something about shortages. You've heard something about, um, about the overall macroeconomic crisis that is being suffered at the present, uh, in part because Venezuela imports the vast majority of food that it consumes and other consumer goods. And so if anything happens with the funding used to import those goods, suddenly you have these bottlenecks and you have the, the, the kind of shortages that, you know, that have occurred and creeped up in, um, in Venezuela. Communers, uh, communers, comuneros, um, are struggling to figure out how to deal with this question of production. They're doing so, I think, in, in different ways. Some are using government grants to develop new productive uh, 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 units, you know, they're developing factories, they're developing um, productive spaces in the barrios, in the urban areas. Some are connecting and, uh, you know, and binding their own participatory democracy in urban areas directly with rural producers. So a coffee farm or a sugar farm that's communally managed in the countryside might directly supply a factory or a packaging plant in the barrios. This is the case of El Panal Commune in, in western Caracas. Others are in, in some ways adapting to this question of what it means to live in the barrios as a space of, uh, of circulation of goods and of people, and so they're forming cooperatives to distribute goods or cooperatives to transport people to and from uh, work. And people are being very incredibly creative when it comes to what it means to build this, and to be creative means to stretch the legal structure, to stretch the rules, to try to build things that maybe don't look like a commune in reality, but um, are developing according to and toward the horizon of this communal logic. Others have raised a question, which is a very important question, a crucially important question of, and, and it's what Chavez in this last speech of his, the Golpe de Timon, the strike at the helm, called, uh, called communal culture or the spirit of the commune. He said what's missing and what's lacking most is the spirit. It's even more important than the commune itself. And this means everything from how it is that people live together, how it is that they exist together, what kind of community exists, but it also means the question of what it is that the communes are producing. And so there's this, uh, you know, in the, in the book, I quote the former commune minister who says something very, very, really striking when he said, the commune is not only about production, the commune is also something that is produced. It's the product. It's this process of coming together that creates a new subjectivity and a new popular understanding of, of what community means. And a great example of this in my mind is a, uh, is a commune that's being developed or has been developed in the Cementerio region of southern Caracas, which is a really uh, sort of dangerous um, uh, part of the city um, in which the primary contradiction to be confronted by the neighbors was not immediately what do we produce. It was not immediately how do we organize ourselves to get state funds for such and such. The immediate problem and the immediate challenge to be confronted was the question of gang violence. And, and I like to point to this because it, I think, draws out the uh, materiality 
of cultural struggle because what was produced in the course of producing a gang truce, the first product of this commune, was a very different understanding of how uh, the communities would live and function and work together. And this is a commune, you know, if I, you know, to describe it, it's a commune comprised of young men who in their free time do wild motorcycle tricks. Um, and so we're talking about a very different kind of commune from the commune of, you know, of, of, of you know, fabric, uh, you know, textile workers in Western Caracas or the countryside commune of uh, coffee, sugar, plantain producers. So this question of producing culture is a central, uh, a central question and a central contradiction um, in this whole process. Now, should I continue talking? Yeah, or maybe, well, <laughs> no, no, that was great. I mean, your, your comments in the book raised so many questions and I, just sitting here, I was cycling through a bunch of them. Um, <clears throat> I guess one of the things that I, I, one of the questions that was just raised was, I mean, you, you do a great job at talking about the antagonism between the state and the, the vitality of this movement that existed prior to Chavez. I mean, all of the work that you did and we created Chavez, you know, the, the, your, your first book, which is, you know, really kind of goes deep into the, into the history of the way that the, this is, all, these are organic movements that existed autonomously and independently of Chavez, the space that Chavismo created. But I was wondering to what degree that antagonism, how exhausting is it? And, and, and especially in this moment of crisis, how much energy is put to defending a state that it's funda that's fundamentally an, an, an antagonist, that's, that, that there's a contradiction with? And is there any... Is there any move, I mean, this idea of, 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 a, of a, a vital political culture that's socialistic, that's, that's collective, that's, that's anti-commodified, that's, anti, that's, anti, that's somehow antithetical to capitalist values, is, uh, is, a, is a wonderful vision, but uh, is, there any, is there any vision, is there any vision of how to move beyond it and, and, to, and to not just constantly be in conflict with the, with the Chavista, with the Bolivarian governing class that might be corrupt, that might be, you know, repressive and, and, actually, and actually transcend that, that tension. I mean, it must be exhausting to constantly having to defend a state that you're in con conflict with. Absolutely. And I think this is really an important element of it. I don't, I mean, to, the short answer, I think, is that you don't transcend this conflict. I think you come up with different ways to manage it, right? For um, other, that's what, it, so it's, that's the, that's the horizon? It's just well, like, well, so, yeah, let's work through it a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it, it is exhausting, I think, right? At the same time, though, and it's worth pointing out that despite the fact that the communes are a non-state form, that they point toward, I believe, a non-state horizon, that the state sees them as an antagonistic force and treats them as such often, the biggest ally of the communes has been the president, both Chavez and Maduro now. In other words, Chavez was absolutely not, I don't want to say essential, but key to the development and the emergence of these communes, to their generalization, and key also central to the expansion of an understanding of what it means to build communal power. And here, I think, uh, the timeline is very funny to think about because this last speech of Chavez is actually really the key point. You know, Chavez had been talking about communes before this, but part of what's going on in 2012 is that I, I think he knows he's very ill. He knows he's going to die. He knows that when he dies, if he looks at previous political processes and radical uh, movements, he sees that they're they become a terrain of struggle, um, you know, and people are trying to, to say, well, no, I'm, I get to speak for who Chavez was. And so Chavez said, I will sit down and make it perfectly clear what it means to be a Chavista. And this, is at least, is how the grassroots have taken that, uh, that speech, because, you know, because they say, you know, listen, now we know perfectly well that to be a Chavista is to be a comunero, and if you don't support the communes, then you're betraying Chavez. But what they've also discovered is that there are a million and one traitors um, willing to use the name of Chavez to do so. And so you have this tension uh, heightening and, and even sharpening, despite the fact that Maduro was very supportive of the communes. Um, you have the Supreme Court, for example, uh, in, you know, antagonistically uh, attacking some of the communes. You have leaders arrested by local and, you know, and national police on some occasions. You have a general process in which the most, this most radical element comes under attack by elements within the state and within the, the political apparatus. And then, of course, you have the crisis. And what the crisis means for the communes is, is a very tense and fraught question. On the one hand, it's clearly terrible. Funding 
that you know was devoted to communes or devoted to importing, for example, their you know the primary material for some things they produce has dried up. The political antagonism between the national government and the opposition has certainly uh, put a dent in the very uh, lively and open political atmosphere, I think, that you could put it that way, once prevailed, in which people were having these conversations and discussing and pushing, and yet there's this process whereby it, comes, it becomes a, a necessity to defend a government, right? Um, and you, when you have a government receding a bit into a besieged fortress mentality, um, then some of this debate is lost as well. People don't cease to support the government, but it becomes a very difficult question. What is it that our grassroots participatory production is doing uh, when the government is so focused on the opposition and so focused on coup threats and all of these things? At the same time, I think it bears pointing out that uh, you know, every crisis is an opportunity. I think the right knows this a lot better than the left, and I think the left could learn something about how to manage crisis and how to uh, see the potential in crisis. What this means concretely in this situation, though, is that the crisis has forced and provoked very sharp debates about what it means to be and exist in an oil economy. When the oil price was very high, when imports were very, very cheap, the debates were raised often um, about oil dependence, and yet they were put to the side very quickly. Um, it was very easy and much easier, in fact, to import food than it was to produce food. Um, there were efforts, they were partial, and some of them failed and some of them succeeded, but you still have a country that is very, very much reliant on, on imported goods. Um, and so one of the good things about the crisis is that people are finally having these discussions. People in the communes are saying, well, we are literally getting no money from the government. We have to survive. What is it that we can produce? What is it that we can do? People are producing indigenous you know, uh, you know, products. People are turning to indigenous even alcohols. There's a very funny uh, picture that of, of right-wing protesters with a sign that said, we don't want kukui, which is an indigenous uh, alcohol. We don't want kukui, we want to be able to drink like we used to. Um, exactly, they wanted imported scotch. And so, you have, but you have this appearance of domestically produced items, and, and it's not to say that it's a good thing, it's born of necessity, but at the same time, it's, it's part of a process of thinking about what it means to develop locally and develop uh, you know, production. I think, Overall, when we look for opportunity in the crisis, I think we have to understand that when you have a government um, like the Maduro government that is sort of on its heels, desperate, uh, not able to import all the goods that people need, and when you have a private sector which is historically incapable and unwilling to produce the goods that people need, that would much rather play the role of intermediary importing goods than actually producing things that people need, um, then the communes can appear as a very appetizing alternative. You know, here you have people willing to put in the work uh, at very low cost to produce on a local level, to decentralize the production process, to avoid the kind of chokehold um, of the import sector, which has become such a political liability for the Venezuelan government, in which if the imports don't show up, suddenly the government's in crisis because there's no food on the shelves. If people are producing domestically, that can be seen as a very attractive alternative. And that's why I kind of conclude the book by saying that, you know, if, if Chavez, describe the situation as la comuna o nada, in other words, it's the commune or nothing, I think that actually becomes, in the present, a political imperative. Um, if the government continues to attempt to convince private producers to keep the shelves full, even though these private producers turn around and stab it in the back whenever they can, if it continues to appeal to the sort of middle class as a sort of safeguard of the stability of the Chavista process, I think it's actually doomed to pretty quick failure. And that, you know, as I put it in the, in the end of the book, I think the time has come for the government to really bet on the communes, to bet on the abilities and the creative abilities of the people to produce on a grassroots level, to instead of investing millions and billions of dollars in importing goods, to invest, invest that money in uh, people producing what things, what people need on the local level. And
you know, the, the economist Mark Weisbrot has, has pointed out, you know, some, some of this in, in, in striking ways that part of the pain that the Venezuel that Venezuelans have lived over the past couple of years has involved a dramatic reduction of the goods that are imported into the country. Things are just not showing up and not coming in and people are developing alternatives. Uh, but what that also means is that uh, there's a, almost, uh, you know, a much, <laughs> there's like a, a propitious situation in which local production, domestic production becomes a lot more, uh, you know, appetizing and attractive both for the government and for the consumers and for, you know, the Venezuelan population. Um, Chum, is there, is there, I mean, you're, it was interesting, you know, the, the point where, the, where you, if you suggested that one way out is the state, is the government to turn to the commune as a, as, as a way out, is there, is there support, is there, I mean, the, the, the image of the state that you present here is pretty negative in, in terms of the, the, the corruption and the repression and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, either, either people have good motives and intentions such as Maduro but, but is incompetent or besieged or, or there's just self-serving and, and, and rent-seeking elites that, that have moved into the Bolivarian, the space created by the Bolivarian Revolution. To what degree is there a movement within the governing elite that, that might turn to the commune as opposed to the state devouring itself in the commune, be, in the commune kind of I mean, emerging from uh, that, you know, filling that vacuum? I think that's, that's the essential question and I mean, I think uh, I hope I haven't made, I hope I haven't come across as too optimistic because that would really be a, that would really be a you know a disadvantage because if you just look at the basic mathematics of the situation you have uh, chavismo in the opposition and then you have chavismo divided between sort of radical grassroots sectors and other sectors let's put it that way whether they be increasingly powerful military sectors governing sectors those who invested in the private sector themselves um, and you know a whole range of sectors that are antagonistic to grassroots communal uh, power. The odds are really not in our favor if we look at it that way. There is a, a very small sector fighting a very uh, heroic struggle to build this alternative. Um, and unless the government makes some kind of move toward this, it's going to continue to persist as a, a voluntaristic alternative to a hegemonic capitalist order, which is what has existed, which is what, you know, continues to exist. What happened is that there's a sort of magical moment in which the state began to develop these things. It began to support them and began to push them, in part because Chavez and others some others realized very clearly that they were only in power because of the grassroots. And I don't mean elections. I mean, there was a coup in 2002, and it was only the grassroots revolutionaries that brought them back to power. And, and so you had a government that realized um, that it depended fundamentally on grassroots movements and developed them and actually sought far beyond the caricature that you hear about of sort of trying to buy off political support. No, the, you cannot explain the development of grassroots power in Venezuela uh, through this narrative of a government trying to sort of placate the masses and keep them in line because what you see are unruly masses, unruly institutions that the state is supporting and saying, oh, this is radical democracy, this is communal power. Um, and whether or not that moment is passed, I think, is, is an open question. I mean, that, and that does raise a question in terms of how, repli how, how much this is, one could replicate this. I mean, it, the, 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 the description is very, you, I mean, that the whole point is that these are deeply rooted in Venezuelan history, 1989, 1992, you know, not 2002. These are, these are very particular to uh, a sense of Venezuelan history, you know, a, a, a fine, you know, fine grained, you know, atten uh, um, awareness of, of, of local struggle and how that relates to the state. Um, and, I, and so in what way might the commune, as, as it's being conceived and constructed in Venezuela, be modular, be re you know, replicated elsewhere? In, 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 I mean, or how much is it very, very specific to Venezuelan history? Because that is part of the argument, that it's deeply rooted in Venezuelan history. So that's to what true. degree does that limit its... Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question, because on the one hand, when you look at you know, there's this tension in, in trying to explain and describe what happened in recent Venezuelan history because you have these long-term continuities. In other words, you have people struggling and building and developing movements. And yet, then you have this moment in which the impossible becomes possible. 
In other words, this moment of rupture in 1989. And I think we have to both be attentive to continuities, but also understand um, the unforeseeability that bursts into history in certain moments. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, almost trite now to say that Venezuelan elites did not see this coming. Um, and, and it really you know, caught them off guard. Um, and that speaks to both the particularity of it, um, but also to the, you know, the unpredictability of, of what can happen in any place at any time. But the sort of breaking open of history is what begged this question of what would fill it. And I mean, of course, Latin American history is full of ruptures and openings that are filled with less appetizing alternatives, let's put it that way, or you know, more often than not, radical leaders who become moderates, um, who preach opposition to the status quo before accommodating themselves very directly and easily with that status quo. And so what was really particular about this process and has been particular about this process is the way that it extended um, its radicalization, deepened that radicalization, and continued to push. Um, and you know, while it was in many ways particular to Venezuela, at the same time it was a constant learning process. If you told, uh, you know, Venezuelans in 1998 that soon they would be talking about Gramsci and Luxembourg on national TV and talking about building uh, 21st century socialism, it would have been, exactly, you know, and, and so you, you had this process, this radical process of pedagogy in which Chavez was of course educator but also very much educated um, and transformed in the process and in a sort of powerful dynamic that while, you know, growing out of very specific tendencies and struggles in Venezuela, was not, you know, yeah. only located there. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I have other questions, but maybe should we should we open it up to the audience for questions, or should we just just so it seems like this we have a nice crowd, so we probably have a lot of questions. Should I? You think um, they're a nice crowd? Should I see to talk yet? Yeah, maybe if anybody has questions, they can come up to the mic. Oh, and, okay. Huh? One minute. One okay. minute. Okay. One um, minute limit on the questions. Mm -hmm. One person at a time. Um, and maybe you could, if anybody wants to speak, you can like wait around here. Yeah. Sure. Do you want to? Mm -hmm. Do you want you want them to come up here? It's <laughs> fine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um, so the question is about local government, Chavista, non-Chavista, what kind of, you know, what is the nature of these governments, how they relate to one another, especially across this partisan divide with regard to the communes. I mean, the communes are Chavista. That's, uh, they're not by definition Chavista, but they are in practice Chavista, in a way that, for example, the communal councils are not. There are lots of opposition communal councils um, in which people get together and, you know, operate like a neighborhood committee and figure things out. Um, the communes are a specific project. Um, in their project for building a specifically not local power, but what is, you know, the key word is often territorialized power, territorial socialism. And what's very interesting is that there's this local reference point uh, for when people begin to describe this, and they use this term coined by Simon Rodriguez, who's the uh, teacher of Simon Bolivar, um, who spoke of what he called toparchy, these local self-governing republics uh, dispersed across the country. This was this sort of ideal, a utopian vision that he had, and yet it's, it's taken on this new importance in, in contemporary Venezuela. And this gets back to debates around what to do um, in the 1980s after the Caracaso, after this mass rebellion, you had this flourishing of local councils, local horizontal democracy. Um, and yet there were people who said, this is wonderful, this is amazing, and yet we cannot remain at the local level. How is it that we can unify this into a force that's capable of pushing forward a political project? And I think the communes, in a way, are answering that call uh, in a different way um, decades down the line. Um, and so as a result, you have this sort of uh, insistence by some sectors, um, particularly academic sectors, that say Chavismo has now become exclusionary. That what began as an inclusive process to, to incorporate more people is now exclusionary. 
What this boils down to often is, is a sort of like reverse classism argument. Otherwise, poor, rich people are not allowed to be in the communes. Um, and that, like I said, that's not by definition true, but you cannot be the bourgeoisie and be in the commune by definition because you are, your, your, your existence is, you know, relies on the exploitation of labor um, of others. And so this is a vision which seeks to encompass all Venezuelans but in a transformed society. In other words, everyone is, is part of this communal project, granted that everyone lives in equality down the road once these, these barriers are broken down. Um, and so I think that's maybe not exactly what you were looking for, but a beginning of of, of getting toward the question. I mean, is that contradiction, is that debated and discussed and is overt, the contradiction between formal bourgeois universalism of the liberal state and, and the, and the class-specific composition? In academia, um, you'd be surprised. In, uh, how, in, in academia, because there's a new tendency to say, well, Chavismo is exclusionary, um, and, and, and it's you know, this project for inclusion that, by the way, has included millions more people in just voting and participating, and not, that's not to mention the qualitative inclusion of participatory democracy and all these things in which Venezuelans, especially poor, dark-skinned Venezuelans, who were not involved in politics for many decades, feel an ownership over politics and ability to participate in it. And yet here on the sort of rear end of it, show up some academics to say, well, now you're, you know, you're discriminating against the rich. And so it is actually discussed yeah, and so debated. It's, you know, the return but it's, but no, but what it Jewish, is, is the, the Jewish question. Exactly. It's this, 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 this <laughs> deeply sort of prototypically Marxist question in which, of course, you know, we're moving toward a universal society in which we all live in harmony, and yet we're just not there yet. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Carl, that's my son. Um, <laughs> I had a question following up on your last question about uh, its applicability in other parts of the region. I'm wondering about um, the service of the communal process in other progressive governments that have arisen or come to power in, in uh, Ecuador and, and um, Bolivia and elsewhere. And tan tangential to that also, has the ALBA regional block process helped or hindered the communal? That's a good question. I think when we look at the broad distinctions between governments in the region, this, and when we look specifically at this thing called the, the pink tide, or whatever you want to call it, this Latin American left-wing swing, which many people are now speaking of and, and observing what appears to be the end of. Um, we have to draw some important distinctions, I think. You've got, on the one hand, very sort of left, liberal, progressive governments, on the one hand, and more radical governments. Often those more radical governments are named as Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador. Um, even within those, however, I think you've got a very different uh, understanding of the role of participation. Um, and in Venezuela, what you had was a very, uh, I, mean, I sort of mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, you know, a willingness driven in large part by Chavez himself to, to allow participation to really have a huge influence in political in the political life of Venezuelans in a way that, for example, in Ecuador, it was seen as an, a nuisance often or unruly or anarchistic. And you have that in Venezuela. You had this back and forth where Chavez would call people anarchists and call them sort of all sorts of names, and they'd call him names, and you know they'd go back and forth. Um, and yet, participation was given uh, uh, you know, a really decisive import in that in Venezuela in the Venezuelan context that you haven't seen. Um, in my view, in many other places, Bolivia, in some ways, as, is an exception. But um, the, the the spectrum almost shifts toward uh, you know government, social welfare. Um, as the minimum, the bare minimum of what it means to be a left-wing government, and then radical participatory democracy as a sort of maximal program. Uh, my question, my question is looking ahead. I mean, I have two questions. The class in the distribution is that controlled by the government or controlled by the communists? And secondly, looking ahead to 2018, when all these elections coming up and all the rejection of peace in Colombia, uh, what does the future seem like for the left? Looking ahead to the next two years. I don't really want to answer that question. <laughs> 
So no, I will. Um, so, it, so there was a reference to these claps. This, so this was an emergency measure adopted by the Venezuelan government to directly deliver um, consumer, basic consumer goods to people's doorsteps. I don't, you know, I can't speak too authoritatively. I'm not, I actually don't know if anyone can. Um, but in many cases they worked very well, and in some cases they didn't. Um, there was a complaint that they were chavista. Um, in other words, that opposition people were excluded again. I often find that to be half true and half a lie, um, and, and so it's hard to tell. But it was, it was in, I think it's important to understand that in no ways it was it a uh, good thing that the government had to resort to direct delivery of consumer goods because it reflected the depth um, of the crisis, and it reflected the um, deep corruption within the food distribution sector that was kind of being bypassed by that, you know, by that mechanism. As for the future of the left in Latin America, I mean, we are living through some really serious turning points. Um, and I don't think I need to recite these for everyone, but you have, of course, uh, so-called uh, constitutional maneuvers in places like Paraguay and Brazil, which function as coups. In other words, they remove popular elected governments and replace them with right-wing governments. You have legitimate elections like that of Mauricio Macri in Argentina, which is really one of the worst of all, I think. Um, who immediately turns to something like a structural adjustment uh, uh, austerity program. You have the very recent events in Colombia which reflect the power of um, Uribismo, in other words, this e extreme right-wing uh, Latin American tendency best expressed by Alvaro Uribe, the sort of former narco-terror president of Colombia, maybe future narco-terror president of Colombia. Um, and I talk actually for a while, and when I'm talking about the Venezuelan right, there's a chapter in the book about the 2014 protests, I spend a lot of time trying to really dig out this uh, dangerous tendency, which is this resurgent right on a, con on a continental level. And it's really a frightening right. I mean, it's been, it's been that way for decades. I mean, I think people who spend a lot of time in Latin America realize that, that the Latin American right is something like fascists, um, even though we may disagree on the use of that term. Why? Because it's characterized by deep anti-communism, hatred of people who look different, hatred of the poor, um, and the real sort of non-existence of those sectors um, for polite society. And what you have is a new phase of that right in which especially young leaders are developing across these countries. They're incredibly violent. They are joining together and, and you know, uh, networking across borders. You have, so these right-wing Venezuelan students traveling to Colombia, meeting with Uribe, you know, meeting with other uh, sort of state terrorists and doing it all, and here's the second really frightening part, in the name of democracy, right? In the name of equality, in the name of being opposed to state repression. So there's this, a really, you know, frightening development. And not only that, but I also talk about the way in which protesters in Venezuela have incorporated and adopted nonviolent techniques and have been trained in nonviolent techniques by nonviolent, you, know, uh, you know, foundations that are funded by the U.S. government and using these strategically toward very violent ends. So, you know, this is a very, very frightening aspect. Of course, Colombia is really almost just a canary um, in the coal mine of what's going to or potentially could happen across the region. And Mexico is, a, is the other big question mark, whether it will go sharply to the right or sharply to the left. And, and the right learning how to win elections, I mean learning, winning at the, at the polls in Colombia and in Argentina and yeah. Sao Paulo. I think the one thing just to add really quickly is that in the experience of Macri in Argentina, the, hopefully the experience in Brazil, although these local elections didn't, pan, didn't you know, appear to pan out this view, is that Macri immediately did things which were immensely unpopular. And so if you look at these right-wing governments, again, including Mexico, Paraguay, Brazil, Argentina, it doesn't seem as though they would win an election right now. But this could be kind of a temporary you know, bug in them working out their new governing strategy. And this speaks to the fact that the Venezuelan right, which is trying to now have a referendum, which they're only, they can only have a referendum thanks to Chavismo, this is part of this sort of you know, process of deepening democracy, has no plan to govern. And so there's speculation that they actually don't want power right now because it would mean governing a crisis, right? And so they actually want to hold off, let the Chavistas suffer some more and win the next election in 2019. But One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, sort of following up on the questions about uh, the left in Latin America more broadly, and hopefully these aren't too much out of your area, but uh, I was wondering if you could speak more about Bolivia in particular. Uh, Evo Morales would seem to have perhaps the most political capital of sort of the remaining pink tide leaders right now, still a very popular leader. And I feel like maybe a question that wasn't answered with Chavez is what happens to Chavismo after Chavez is gone? It, it doesn't seem that they've quite figured it out. What happens uh, in, Bolivia, in Bolivia after Evo Morales is gone? Mm -hmm. uh, if his party is no longer in power, how do they lock in their gains? How do they build in their gains? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good question. Um, I think one thing to, to realize is that, uh, you know, is that Morales has a great deal of political capital, and partly because he has a great deal of financial capital in the sense that uh, the Bolivian government has actually been praised by international financial institutions for the, uh, not austerity, but the sort of, uh, you know, responsibility of its, uh, of its financial program. And while that sounds maybe like a bad thing to be praised by the IMF and the World Bank, I think the Venezuelan side suggests that maybe, you know, we could use a little bit of macroeconomic, uh, you know, uh, leadership and then policy making when it comes to really just, you know, keeping everything buckled down. Um, you know, keeping the economy afloat is not the objective of these governments, but, you know, it's turning out to be a pretty powerful precondition for, uh, for elected socialism to be a possibility. Um, what happens in Bolivia after Evo? I think that's a great question. I think in, in Venezuela, it's important to and I would, I would constantly be that person who was like, uh, you know, this is not about Chavez, this is about the movements, blah, 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 blah. And then Chavez died, right? And the feeling, not only like for myself, but I mean, just the mass feeling that something crucial was lost was incredible. Um, and then the practical consequ consequence of realizing what was lost, you know, not the, again, not the essential leadership of this sort of like uh, great uh, benefactor, but a moment of condensation of political forces where people really knew what they were fighting for and what direction they were moving in, and that's been dramatically undermined. Not all the fault of Maduro, you know, there's economic crisis, antagonism, and assault by the opposition, um, and you're in an overall situation in which people are trying to figure out maybe within Chavismo who wants to be the next president and how to fight for that, how to build that. Um, and so the question of what to do after the leader is gone is, I think, a very important one. I don't think it has to be a question of leadership as an individual thing, but a question of, how, of a coalescence of forces and of a horizon and a project. I mean, that was, that was true, right? I mean, it sounds silly to say, but, it, you know, and, and there were these debates about whether or not there should be, you know, whether or not the president should be reelectable, and, and, you know, of course, this was one of those moments in which the foreign press said, oh, look, you know, Chavez wants to perpetuate himself in power, and a lot of people on the, on the grassroots level were looking around and saying, who the hell else is going to lead this thing? Um, because we also have to remember that he was an incredible politician. He was someone who was able to balance political forces, um, including, you know, the military, grassroots communists, you know, and this is not an easy balancing act to carry out, and he was very, very good at it. Um, and so the, it's important to, dis, I almost don't want to say distinguish, but it's important to understand that the celebration of Chavez was not uh, the celebration of an individual. It was the celebration of a collective project with which people identified to such a degree that, you know, it felt like a religious faith, right? It's not this sort of, you know, there's these, terrible journalism that came out after he died about how people said, no, Chavez didn't die, Chavez is still alive. And they were like, see, look, it's kind of religious. And they were like, no, people were actually insisting that this is a much broader thing that he's, his name became the stand-in for. Well, one of the great, great descriptions in the book is the, 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 culture, the, the, the murals mm -hmm. in the barrios de la Otrebeta, no? Yeah. So the way that Chavez yeah. becomes you know, the, the metamorphosis into... Yes. Less, 
a skateboarder. Yeah. And, you know, and this and, points also toward tensions uh, within Chavmis. So there's this movement in, especially in eastern Caracas, called Otrobeta, which is a sort of a youth barrio movement. And what they did is they went around, they started spray painting these murals of Chavez on a motorcycle and doing a wheelie, and Chavez boxing and playing basketball and <laughs> rapping. And but and 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 so on the one hand, it was a way to it was an attempt to communicate and 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 uh, direct develop a relationship with disaffected barrio youth who have yet to be incorporated into this political process, but at the same time it was a scandal within Chavismo because there are deep class tensions within Chavismo. And it's not sort of uh, concrete, simplistic class tensions, it's culture too, it's uh, you know, the fact that many people who are you know, in Chavista leadership think that they are sort of dignified, you know, political leaders and that they don't have to worry about the sort of poor kids in the barrio anymore. And that those poor kids are there to take handouts from the state and not to be part of that state and transform it. And so it's a deep divide. Um, but it's one in which the figure of Chavez takes on these different variations and is able to be used and deployed in a number of ways. Um. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Very quickly. Um, I really would like to see if both of you can elaborate in the different similarities in this crisis that Venezuela is facing right now with what happened in Chile during the 70s. Uh, as you know, uh, copper was the main, you know, Chile was, Salvador Allende was getting most of his revenue from copper. Mm -hmm. And the price of copper was destroyed through Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And Chile got in trouble. In this case, in the case of Venezuela, curiously, we have fracking. Mm -hmm. And the United States overflowed the market with oil. Mm -hmm. And fracking has more than 40, 45 years. Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence mm -hmm. that they have been able to use fracking and destroy the price of oil. But at the same time, this reminds me of something that Thomas Shannon said, and I think that was in an interview that he did uh, five years ago, something like that, for foreign policy. And he said something like that. He said, for us, we cannot forget and for us, it's acceptable that Venezuela has been able to isolate the United States and Canada from the other nation of the Americas. What he is talking about is Venezuela has been able to create UNASUR, CELA, Petro Caribe, ALBA, and we cannot accept that and we cannot forget that. So I would like to see, you can elaborate, between the difference between you know, what happened in Chile and what's going on right now in Venezuela. Thank you. So um, to take us outside of Latin America for a second um, and talk a little bit about the parallels or lack of, lack of parallels with the Arab world mm -hmm. um, and what happened there over the last few years. So um, I actually wrote a little book that was terrible and not published by Verso um, about <laughs> the rise of civic participation in, in the Arab world sort of post you want to call that um, Arab Spring, um, and there was an explosion, and um, much of that has been destroyed. Um, I'm curious about the history of the commune, and I will read your book, but um, just to understand a little bit about sort of your thoughts on how from 1989 onwards, those communes were able to develop. What sort of circumstances, what sort of context do you think Venezuela was able, or those communes were able to take advantage of in order to be able to flourish? Um, um, just in terms of understanding sort of what allows these sorts of, uh, of initiatives to actually grow as opposed to sort of die. <laughs> My question is very short. Uh, Based on your definition uh, about uh, commune, commune is a pro production unit uh, running uh, by uh, uh, collective uh, units, grassroots units, uh, independently from government or state. So in that case, what's the difference between um, commune and uh, kalkhoz? the collective uh, farms in Soviet Union, <laughs> and uh, co-op organization in capitalistic society. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just say that these three questions in many ways are very similar, especially the first two. I, would, I mean, reading, reading about the communes and particularly the productive one, the agrarian productive ones, one was, it calls to mind what happens in Chile in 19, in 19, you know, the creation of these industrial belts, these, the seizing of industry. And, and I was thinking about the difference between the two and how you know, Allende inherits an, an you know, a state that was very dependent on copper, like Venezuela is dependent on oil, but also had the, the, a structure, the kind of import industrial substitution structure. So there was industry, there was some industry. And I was just thinking in, 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 in terms of, um, it was just wonder, one of the questions is to what degree did these comuneros in Venezuela have a have a sense of the history of these industrial collectives beyond that particular history? Mm -hmm. To what degree are they referencing Venezuela? I mean, uh, Allende and mm -hmm. Chile and what happened in Chile? And yeah, these are great questions. I mean, Allende, the, the Chilean example is just a constant reference yeah. point, and I think uh, the you know the answer I would have given um, is that, that, that one of the sharp distinctions that's often drawn is actually has to do with Allende's strategy, right? Was this question of, and you hear this a lot from the left, that Allende disarmed the workers, left them, you know, left them unarmed in the face of a military onslaught. And this was, this is not tangential, this was often discussed by Chavez and by others. And Chavez, when he said that this process is, is peaceful but armed, he meant it wasn't like, you know, he, he meant it as a critique of what, it, what had happened in Chile. Um, the context is very similar, of course. We're talking about active sabotage, but we're also talking about everyday sabotage. We're talking about people you know, seeking profit in a way that totally damages and destroys and undermines a project for an equal society. Um, we're talking about hoarding. You know, when you hoard goods, it's not only because you're trying to overthrow Allende, it's also because you can resell those goods on the black market for a much higher price. And so all of these things are going on. The, the government narrative in Venezuela is about an economic war, and I think that's misleading if we understand it to be an explicit political attack on the government always. Um, but I think it's very accurate if we understand it to be the many ways in which everyday practices undermine and destroy um, attempts at the, by the state, especially through regulations, to uh, make people's lives livable. Um, so I think the context has a great deal um, in common. Um, However, as, and I, I said the, the main difference has to do with this question, this really complicated question of how Allende courted the military. You know, people say, well, he appointed Pinochet. Um, the, the Venezuela military is gaining a great deal of power. Now, to be clear, it is not the Chilean military. Just in history, sociologically, demographically, it's a very, very different structure. Um, but at the same time, the military has a de decisive amount of power in Venezuela these days. Um, and the question of how it will act um, is an important one. I don't think we'll have a right-wing coup, but you may see um, a coup of some kind, or uh, you know, or the the active intervention of the military to push for one or the other outcome in you know when it comes to this referendum process, for example. Um, the question of the Arab Spring, I think, is is very interesting. I so my first book was translated into Arabic and published um, in Jordan, and the person who was uh, you know you know the who's behind the, the process of translating asked me to write an afterword and wanted me to speak to what was going on at that moment, and particularly in Egypt. And I d refused to <laughs> because I, I didn't want to sort of, uh, I, you know, because it would have been in very sort of bad judgment. But, but it really is interesting to think about the ways in which the similarities, the way popular mobilization um, played these roles, and also the question of how to then engage with the state. Um, and of course, the, the options were very, very different when it came to the Egyptian case, um, when it comes to the Brotherhood or the military. But there was something about the left-wing uh, call for the fall of the government 
that struck me as, as resonating with questions that come up through this Venezuelan you know, process, namely what happens when the government goes. Um, and what we're seeing happened when the government went is very, very painful and, and powerfully dangerous for the left as well. So I think it's all to say that I think a lot of the questions raised are similar when it comes to participatory governance. You know, when you hear these narratives about the Arab Spring being produced by you know, these young technocratic uh, elites, and you know that's not the full story. It's very similar to the narrative about Venezuela in terms of you know, what, where the source of change comes from, uh, and it neglects this, this participatory grassroots aspect. When you see the erasure um, in the Arab Spring of neoliberalism, right, of, of questions of soci you know, socioeconomic policy, and it becomes simply a question of authoritarianism, as opposed to a question provoked by deep transformations being undergone in the region. I think these echo and resonate uh, very much with the Venezuelan case. On the question of these of these other forms of communes, I'm not, there's not much that I that I could say. I think um, I think there are different ways in which different sources for what the commune means in Venezuela emerged. It was not simply in a sort of constantly pushing back on the Paris commune as the meaning of commune, um, and you had there are ways in which, for example, the Yugoslavian experience, uh, you know filtered into, through different thinkers, into the Venezuelan consciousness, the ways in which indigenous and Afro community, you know, uh, histories filtered into this understanding of what the commune is, and the way in which um, these, just this simple understanding in Venezuela about what democracy ought to be um, began to play a role um, from the 50s onward. And I think those all sort of coalesced into what, um, into what became the communes with very little reference to I think particularly to the Soviet, you know, experiments um, and prior, you know, situations. Uh, just quickly on uh, the Chilean parallel again, and the and uh, Chavez's stress on the what he perceived as the differences between the processes and the the notion that the masses are in some sense armed in Venezuela. Is that a reality or a, a, a strongly mm -hmm. held desire? Because uh, you speak of the power of the institutional mm -hmm. army. Mm -hmm. But are there local militias? Are the communes mm -hmm. addressing yeah. self-defense? Uh, all of those mm -hmm. related questions? Yeah. I mean, so on a very concrete level, the population is armed, although that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, it's a good thing. But, but to the meat of it, yeah, I mean, there's a long history of local self-defense and what's very interesting is the way in which the Chavez government, on the one hand, depended on um, and supported these local self-defense units, whether you call them militias or they're often called colectivos or, or whatever else you want to call them. It's very, very controversial for a liberal society, whether it's here or in Venezuela. They're called paramilitaries. They're called all sorts of things. Um, but what's in some ways particular about the Venezuelan experience is that at least for the most, you know, for the most part and through the, throughout most of this process, there were revolutionary communists who were fighting for local autonomy, often against the state. They developed an armed structure against the previous governments uh, prior to Chavez, um, and they were very radically, in some ways radically democratic, militaristic, but radically democratic at the same time. Um, and so, yes, so to answer you know, your question, there, was, there were often clashes between, Ch between the government and these local militias, but there were also deep sort of relationships and resonances, which are not the sort of stuff of nightmares that the newspapers would tell you. Uh, thanks a lot for the really interesting talk. I really liked your first book. Um, and I had a question about, you were talking about how um, the, the communes and the Bolivarian Revolution have allowed for a lot of people who previously didn't engage in politics to currently engage in new radical forms of politics. Mm -hmm. And then also now people who see the food shortages um, and see like local production as a new way to, to move themselves, to go, a new direction to go in. To what extent are these, the people who are like taking part in the Bolivarian Revolution, do they identify as left wing versus to what extent are they trying to, is it something maybe like Podemos or like Peronism that is able to bring together people who previously didn't have a political identity or might even identify as right wing into a left wing project? Um, yeah, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thank you very much for uh, this talk. Actually, there are a lot of new facts I learned. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, you know, my name is Exir, and I'm working on a transfer to Hunter College, and I'm a member of the International Marxist Tendency, so my position is pretty clear. Um, I mean, I, I think that 
you know, as much as we talk about local participation, as long as the communes between, you know, as long as the, the rural communes and the urban communes, they're related to each other by market force, and as long as the most, most of the country is still, um, you know, capitalist, mm -hmm. then um, it's unavoidable that there will be a state because you're going to have to mediate between the conflict between the communes and the capitalists. You're going to balance things, which, you know, you mentioned how Chavez has to be a balancer. You also have to mediate the situation between the you know urban and rural you know production and you you've seen that recently actually in Bolivia where um, artisanal miners mm -hmm. actually went on strike for w what I think is a clear cut reactionary position of not wanting their own you know outsourced workers to be able to mm -hmm. you know uh, go on strike mm -hmm. and I think this is you know all an example of how without you know going to the core of the you know problem which is capitalism and not just neoliberalism but if you don't you know go there then there will always be these contradictions there will always be the state and then the bureaucracy and then the careerists so um yeah that's just, yeah Thanks. i mean I'll, I'll answer that one first uh, in part because i think it's really important and i think it's in in many senses absolutely right um the question of mediation is is hugely important. Uh, you know, I actually really kind of want to emphasize the fact, though, that that actually, I think, I think derives mostly from the fact that we're talking about an electoral process, right? We're talking about a process that has had to, and this touches on the second, the second question, which has had to build a block capable of winning elections. Now, what's interesting is that this block has shifted dramatically over time. It was in, at the beginning, you know, Chavez ran on a sort of very moderate program, um, which was very vague on what kind of radical changes would happen happen, and which even drew in the support of banking sectors and of the middle class. And yet, within a few short years, the block and the base of support for Chavismo radically shifted to be a much more, a much poorer, much more radical sector. And alongside this process was the political transformation, and this gets to the question about whether people identify as leftists. And people came, often came to identify as leftists, came to realize that the things that they valued and were building and were struggling for were values shared by a broader left. Um, the point of the communes is precisely to eliminate this. And that's why I think, in a sense, you're right. In a sense, you point toward the parameters of the overcoming of the state. What's happening in central west Venezuela between communes is that there's an attempt to build a non-market structure, right? Communes that are growing coffee are directly, you know, exchanging with communes that are growing plantains and sugar and corn. Um, and the, the way one organizer describes it, he says, we're trying to build free socialist territories. And they call these axes, um, communal axes that stretch across entire states of the country, um, and that are an attempt to sort of stitch together a communal fabric that ultimately is hoped will, will, you know, will take over the whole country. Now, again, we've touched on whether that's likely or not, how difficult the process is going to be, but that's, that's the objective. The objective is non-capitalist, non-market exchange. Um, as to this in question of inclusion and the transformation of, uh, you know, of Venezuelans in the process, again, it's an electoral process, it's roughly populist if we, if we understand that term, stripped of most of its negative connotations. Uh, what does that mean? It means it coalesces a group of people. This is using kind of Ernesto Laclau a little bit, but you know, in modified form, that coalesces people together who don't necessarily think the same thing at first, right? And yet they can all plug in in a different way and they can deposit their hopes and aspirations in Chavez or in the Constitution in different ways. And yet over time transform and yet over time develop a certain level of consciousness so that Chavez gets elected with 61% of the vote or more in 2006 and says, okay, let's build socialism. You know, you've got this process of education and grassroots building and participation um, and oil money that brings together this broad process that's capable then of making this kind of transformation from a more popular project, which in Latin America always carries a sort of social lefty content into one that's being more explicitly left. As I said, you've got Chavez appearing on TV and saying, I just read this book by Rosa Luxemburg, and here's Gramsci, and he's talking about this. And this is, you know, and so you have this, this broad process of transformation that happens. Now, I worry that the political capital that was developed over the course of those 15, 17 years has been lost very quickly. 
And I think the real question, it's not just a question for Venezuela, but a question for the region as a whole, is how to rebuild. And what, what length of a process we're talking about if we're talking about rebuilding the left in Latin America. All right. Um, <laughs> I just want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, thank you very much to George and to Greg. Uh, thank you to Jacobin for co-hosting this with, with us. Um, have another drink. Buy the book. Um, once again, our Four Futures event is next Thursday. So thanks all for coming. Thank you. I was uh, <laughs> participating.